So I know I've explained this a hundred times. I know I've explained this a hundred times, but again, we're going in the order as it was listed out of the book of Hebrews. Okay, so uh, if you look at that, Samson and then Jephthah. Jephthah actually happens before Samson. Um, we have the same thing with um, Barak and um, Gideon. Um, the order that they were listed out of Hebrews was in a different sequence. But we went with the sequence as, as it's listed um, in the book of Hebrews, um, as the author had stated it there. So we were just walking it from that, again, the heroes of faith. Um, the importance of these heroes, guys, for our faith and the exhortation for our faith, for us to see the magnificent working of God um, through, through all things um, for his people. So, uh, as uh, with all that being said, last week we got into the um, Samson, which is out of Judges chapter 13. So we walked the birth of Samson, um, there with his mother, uh, the uh, testimony from the angel of God uh, to Samson. Um, Clint, um, is your voice staying off of your phone so you don't start with, you know? That's <laughs> right. no, just joking. I'm just joking. So, uh, last week we. Uh, uh, I don't know if Clint was searching it or if I just heard my voice say the Nazarene, and then all of a sudden um, Google said, oh, here's the definition for Nazarene. <laughs> um, so uh, what we've seen was is that it was actually, and then if you go back, you can actually find it in Numbers, in the book of Numbers, I believe it's chapter 6, um, where it lists what a Nazarene is. So they were... Um, Nazarite. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. No, I'm saying Nazarite. Yes, thank you, Mark. Nazarite. And uh, they were. Uh, a Nazarite was one who bound themselves usually voluntarily. It was, it was to be voluntary. It was for a limited time. And um, there was three things um, that they were to basically not do. Okay. Um, and uh, well, it says in provisions, three provisions that they would take, and it was the abstinence of wine, strong drink, and that any fruit of the vine. It was that they would not cut off their hair, and that they would not come into contact with anything that was dead. All right. Uh, so yeah, that was a Nazarite, and um, good evening. So again, so the angel tells him, tells the mother that she is going to have this son, that he will be a Nazarite unto God, and he will be that from the womb. Again, if you go back into the book of Numbers, what you will see was is that it was someone who voluntarily do this for a period, usually a short period of time. Okay. Now the angel tells her that she goes back. She tells her husband. She tells him that the countenance of this uh, angel um, was as of um, as of the angel of God, and that he was awesome. And um, I told you all that I've been wondering who this guy was that was out there talking to my wife. That's how she came back to describe me. Uh, no, but uh, it uh, really beautiful, her faith um, immediately. Uh, Manoah prays immediately to God, and he says, "Man, Lord, please let the man, may, let this man of God come back to me, whom you sent to us." And teach us what we should do for this child will be born. And uh, so, one of the things I brought up last week was, guys, honestly, for every single one of us as parents, grandparents, it should be our prayer. If we have any ones underneath us, it should be our prayers that God lead us and teach us, um, you know, how, how we can be the best for them and to raise them the best that we can. Um, that should be our heart's desire and our prayer. And I thought that was really, really sweet. That was brought up here by the Noah. Now. Uh, the angel is coming back, um, just as um, God answers his prayer. The angel comes, um, appears to her first. She gets all excited. She runs back to Manoah, tells him they all come out there to meet him. And then immediately what Manoah goes to is this whole thing about really wanting to worship um, this angel. And um, the angel responds to him and says, no, I'm not, I'm not going to let these be worshipped. You need to be worshipping this God. And then he comes back and he says, well, then at least tell me your name so that when it comes to pass, I can at least honor you. Which really goes back to that same thing of worship. And the angel's response is, why do you even ask me my name? 
For it is seen that it is wonderful. And you look throughout the scriptures, and there is one individual whose name was wonderful. It was Jesus. Yeah? And I thought that was just really, really neat. Then the Noah ends up turning around, and he says, man, we're going to die because we just seen God. Which, so he even testifies himself of who he is. This, this messenger that came to him in the essence of Christ. Yes, and then he, and he says, man, as he's ascending, if you remember, he ascends through the fire. Yeah? But from the fire into heaven. Yeah? And, um, you know, guys, Jesus Christ, through the fires of hell, but he raised the right hand of the Father. Yeah? And um, for Manoah, it's funny, to me in this, his statements, verse 22, chapter 13, verse 22, he says, Man, we shall surely die because we have seen God. The reason why I think this is funny is because this is the center that every single person really believes. Yeah. They believe that and they would have to die. Yes? Now, one thing that's really, really big to me in this also is coming back into the book of Hebrews. And right before he broke off into this about the heroes of faith, he says something that's really, really neat, that by Christ and his sacrifice and his payment and his atonement, that now, by faith, we can boldly enter the throne of God and draw near even unto God himself. And we can do it without fear. Yeah? Manoah was quite scared <laughs> once he realized that who he was talking to was God. Yeah? We always want to try to run from him. From God, believe that He's out to get us, and you know the reality is that that's not really what God was about and has ever been about. And I think it's beautiful for His wife responds to Him and again through her faith, and she says, "Man, if the Lord had desired to kill us, then He would not have accepted first of all the offering. Second of all, is He wouldn't have told us and shown us all of these things. Oh, I'm sorry. First, He's shown us all these things, and He would not have told the last one was He would not have told us." All of these wonderful things that God was going to do. Yeah? And, uh, I don't know, to me that's an exhortation. Go ahead, Jim. I, I, I think that's funny, too, if you're going along, everybody's running from God, they think he's out to get them and stuff, and like that, in that situation, if God had wanted them dead, they'd be dead. And all of us would be that same way. If that's the way God wanted them to be, they'd be that way. If God wanted us in hell, guess what? There would have been no Christ, and we'd all already been in heaven. Jesus would have never had to left the right hand of the Father, would never have to become flesh, wouldn't have had to endure, you know, keep the flesh perfect, he wouldn't have had to die on the cross, wouldn't have had to go to hell, and wouldn't have had to be raised. If God didn't want us to be saved. If he just wanted the death and destruction, he would have just given it to us. <laughs> Now he's God, you know what I mean? I mean, like, that's what his real heart's desire was, and it is amazing because you know we look at, you know, what Manoah is looking at is physical, right? I mean, like here, here's this guy just appears, literally, just poof, he's there. Yes, bringing such an unbelievable message, it finally is real to you that this is God, and then he ascends, and you watch him ascend right into the heavens. Yeah. What he's looking at is the physicality of all these things. And you know what else he's looking at? Huh? No, 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 Manoah. Manoah. What Manoah is looking at right there. Manoah, what he's looking at right there is he's looking at himself. He's looking at his own sin. He's looking at how he has met up to this God who, just, who was just there. Yeah? And so what would, have, what would God have to do then? He would have to kill you. Yes? So if there's a sign to what Manoah is saying that is dead right. Yeah. Because God would have to kill him. How can you look upon a holy God when you yourself are not holy? <laughs> Heck, even Moses himself, God had to speak through a burning bush. Now, if you remember, all of the rest of them, God spoke through something. Yes? And only with Noah did it say that God spoke directly to him. Everywhere else, God used angels. It was only with Noah that God spoke directly to him. And even in that, though, he still had to do it through a bush. 
You kind of get my point? Like even Noah would not have been able to handle that. Hey, Moses. Yes? I mean Moses, I'm sorry. Guys, my apologies. You're following me. Thank you. All right. I apologize. Wrong name. Probably be a night of that since it's already started off that way. <laughs> it's like the third time that I've used the wrong name. <laughs> There's the wrong name. Sorry. Uh, so, guys, Moses, though, you know, guys, so God spoke, speaks directly to him. And, you know, to, to Moses, and he tells him, man, just to even be here near me, you'd have to take off your shoes. There's like these different, do you remember all that? He tells them, he tells him, listen, you don't even let any people step foot on the mountain. Right? Now, God wasn't down there to face the mountain. He says, you don't even let them step foot because if anyone even looks upon me, they'll die. So there's a side to what Manoah is like kind of thinking there that you can kind of understand. But, you know, what was he missing? He's missing that God loves him, first of all. The God is for him. And if you notice here in the book of Judges with a few of these individuals, this has been something that they really did not see. God does love him. Remember Gideon? Well, if you love me, then why is all this going on around me? And God says, well, it's all going on around you because really, a bunch of it's because of unbelief and the rest of it just is what it is. I still love you. Get up. Go win the victory. Yeah? By the word of God and the sword of Gideon. Yeah? <laughs> and Gideon. <laughs> There was Barak, who ends up taking out one of the most dangerous and vicious kings, and he does it without doing anything. And it was actually a woman, right, with a stake and a hammer. And she made sure the job was done well because the stake went all the way into the ground. Yeah? And then, then he gets to walk in there and, you know, like, yeah, victory, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> what? Man, you guys, you know, most of those individuals, once they realize who was talking to them, though, I mean, that, that fear of those things like that, that's, it is natural because what we look at is ourselves and our sin. What we look at is the natural things around us, and what we don't look at is God and that God's for us and that God loves us. We're not looking at those things a lot of times. Yeah? Where I with Manoah, he wasn't seeing that, and it was really, really sweet to me is that his wife kind of stepped back and she was like, wait a minute. Like, if God was against you, you would already be, like, it would already, this, this conversation would be happening. Like, none of these events would have happened. Yeah? And, you know, guys, and I've had people, you know, um, sharing the gospel with people, and they're like, oh, you know, God doesn't love me. And that's always been one thing, and, um, even before really having this story right here, but that has always been big with me. No, wait a minute. If this is happening right now between us, then God loves you and he's for you. This conversation is happening. Then I know for a fact God loves you. Because how is it that in this big of a world, with this many people that are in it, that God would put all these things together for this moment to be taking place right now? All those evil things that you did, and all the wrong decisions that you made, and all the wrong turns that you made, ended up leading you to this moment right here. How can you say that God does not love you, and that He wasn't even loving you during all of that? Like, don't know why. I know God loves you because this is because we're here right now. We're talking about the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? yeah. And it's really sweet because that's basically the whole point that the that His wife here has is laying this to Him. If God desired to kill us. He wouldn't have accepted our, the offerings. He would not have given us the, all the things that we've been able to see. And also, he would not have given us the words. And I know God, God's for us. Amen. So needless to say, she born the son. Yes? So we, had, we got Samson born last week. Let me see if I missed anything else. No. Um, yeah, guys, I think that's good enough. And the reality of what we all are living in those things. Yeah? And every person lives out those things, that fear, you know, the fear of the judgment that we should have. 
And you know that and there's a side that guys that that is real. That judgment should come. Yeah? And there's evidence that God loves us. Because it ain't. Alright. I don't know. I'm happy about that. I'm sorry for the rest of you that are not. Alright? <laughs> I am happy. <laughs> I'm thankful. All right. Chapter 14, verse 1, guys. So we have Samson now. He's grown up. And it says, Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and he told his father and his mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. I was hoping there would be a lot of young teenage boys here. Hey, listen. If you want, if you're looking around, you say, hey, might be kind of wise to go tell your parents and have them in on me. <laughs> All right. It says, Then his father and his mother, and they said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren, or among all of my people, that you must go and you must get from the uncircumcised Philistines? All right? So to kind of understand, like, as far as territories wise, uh, like, the Philistines bordered them, and they were neighbors in, like, for forever. Okay? Um, the Philistines did not believe in the circumcision. Would worship different gods. Bell was one of the gods that they worshipped. They worshipped many different ones, and from what I kind of understood throughout the history. Uh, but the one god that they would not worship was the living god. Okay? And in that, they refused to be circumcised, which always was kind of the uh, spat back and forth between, and something that was really probably more used as more of a derogatory type thing. To be said like the way that it was like stated. Now don't get me wrong, the faith side of it, very, very big, and the symbolic of that is very, very big. Uh, if you remember, there was a group, um, this is going back all the way back into the uh, before Egypt, but uh, that there was a whole city that ended up believing and being circumcised. Yes? So again, um, to understand it, like it, it, you know, it, it is it was very, very important, yes. And yet, at the same time, um, if you realize, too, by the day of time Jesus comes around, like that becomes like a whole entire thing of your righteousness by it, and something that kind of to undermine or kind of talk against um, other surrounding cities. Um, it was something that was used as a judgment that they could judge somebody else by. And so they would justify them sharing the gospel or not sharing the gospel with it. Or the promise. Okay, so Satan kind of took this whole entire thing, it's kind of my point, and kind of twisted it up. Um, but the statement here is something that does become a statement that is used many times over with the Philistines, the uncircumcised Philistines. Okay, that was kind of one. So, guys, the thing is, is that uh, so he, he asked for this wife, they're wanting him to find one from amongst the people of faith. Yes? And not to go outside of the faith to find a wife. And Samson said to his father, he says, Get her for me. For she pleases me. And that, that there that pleases me, uh, literally, that she is perfect or right in my eyes. Now, this is the from the Hebrew side, guys, this is what God uses to talk about his people. So to understand the strength of the wording when he state makes this statement. You understand that? So he, he's not just saying, oh, I kind of like her. Like he's like, he head over the bar, he's like, man, no, this is like. She's the one for me. Yeah? And so, like, you know, that, that statement is, is a, was a very, very strong. Um, he says, but his father and mother did not know. What they did not know is that the Lord, I'm sorry, but his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord. That he, God, was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. 
So I kind of understand what's all taking place right here. So Samson grows up. Yes. He all of a sudden sees this woman. He wants this woman as his wife. He goes to his father and his mother. He tells them they don't really want that. They want him to be have a wife of faith. And it says here that the insight is, is that they what they did not know was is that God was using this for his purpose, which he already even said that through Samson they would be free from the Philistines. And that God was using this as an opportunity. Okay? And it goes on to say, at the time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Okay. Since, since sin has entered, what is, or I guess I'll just say this way. It oftentimes happens within any of us, saved or not saved, that ever since Adam bit in that fruit, that there are moments in our thought and in our heart where our heart and our thoughts become overwhelmed with the thought and the desires for oneself. Yes? What does that lead to? Pain, pain and suffering, yes? And the other word we use in this scripture, what's used for that is evil, yes? Uh, you know, there's kind of some neat promises that really God gives. One is, is that if you love the Lord, and God works all things for your good. There's another one that says what you meant for evil that God meant it for you. There's another one that says what's impossible for man is possible for God. So, you guys, you know, just in that, okay, kind of understanding, you know, the, the care from the parent's side, their heart, for their son. Yeah? But God is the one who has to work all things. Yeah? And there has to be a level of that trust, and what we'll see in this story is, is that God does use it. Now, don't get me wrong, there's pain and suffering. Okay? But God uses it, and uses it for his people, and for the deliverance, just like he promised. All right? Even though the means by which it all happens may not be the way that most people would want it to all go down and Yeah? So it goes on to say, it says, so Samson went down to Nam, um, with his father and mother, and came to the vineyards of Tanah. Now, now, to his surprise, a young lion came up boring against him, and the spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he tore the lion apart as one would have torn apart a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand. So basically, that lion jumped out, and he grabbed that lion and just ripped that lion apart. The hands, limbs, stomach, everything. And if you rip apart a young goat, you would it, take out their entrails. And everything. Right? And so he does this with this lion. Um, he didn't, it says that um, he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and he talks to that woman. And she pleased Samson well. So after some time he returned to get her. He turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of the lion. He took some of it in his hand, and he went along eating. So he came to his father and his mother, and he gave some to them, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. I'm just going to go ahead and try to read through, guys, okay? And remind me to come back over the line, okay? If I get caught up on this too much, I'm afraid we won't get through the chat. So I want to at least finish out the chat. Okay. So the might come back to the lion and the honey. So his father went down to the woman. His Samson gave a feast there for young men used to do so. Used to when they got married, they got happy and they got a feast. Right? <laughs> oh, sorry. Right. Nowadays they just sit around and cry. <laughs> 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 
Samson gave a feast there, and a young woman, uh, for the young man used to do so. And it happened that when they saw him, that they brought 30 companions to be with him. Then Samson said to them, Let me pose a riddle unto you. For you can, if you can correctly solve and explain it to me within the seven days of the feast, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothes. But if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me 30 linens of garment and 30 changes of clothing. And they said to him, Suppose you riddle that we may hear it. So he said unto them, Out of the ear came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Now for three days they could not explain this riddle. But it came to pass that on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband that he may explain the riddle to us, or else we will burn you in your father's house. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is this not so? So then Samson's wife wept on him and said, You only hate me, you do not love me. You have posed a riddle to the sons of my people, but you have not explained it to me. So he said to her, Look, I have not explained it even to my own father and my mother. So why should I explain it to him? Now she continued to weep on him. The seven days while their feast lasted. And it happened that on the seventh day that he told her because she pressed him so much. Then she explained the riddle to the son of her people. So the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed thirty men. 30 of their men. Now that is a town of the Philistines, so you know. He took their apparel and he gave a change of clothing to those who explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused and he went back to the father's house and Samson's wife was given to his companion, the one who was his best man. So, kind of the events. He's courting the lady. Yes? Going to see her, coming back to his house, going to see her, coming back to his house. The lion jumps out, tries to eat him. He rips the lion apart, leaves the carcass, goes home, doesn't tell mom and dad, goes back and meets the lady, and one of the times he was back and forth, he thought about it again, goes over to see the carcass, finds honey, takes the honey, brings it back to his parents. They all eat of it. Everything's great and wonderful. He throws a seven-day party. Yes? Um, and in these parties and in these feasts, these great feasts that they would have, there would be ton of tons of wine. I mean, it was, it was seven days solid of nothing more than just party. Okay? In this, one of the things that takes place is that there's these 30 people that are invited to come and partake in this party. And so the enigma, the, the, uh, the, the, the question that's being posed to rattle their brains, yes, is about this line of honey, right? The people can't figure it out, and so they start to press his wife, yes? To the point that she ends up saying, you know, you don't love me, you hate me. She whines, she cries, she continues to press day after day after day. <coughs> so finally on the seventh day, he finally gives in, tells her what it means, and immediately she goes and she tells them. Yes? So they're able to explain the riddle. He knows that she was manipulated, and in that, he was manipulated by them. Right? And by the way, who placed the bet? You know, you, yeah, exactly, you know what I mean? So like their whole, like how they were trying to play that, their own selfishness once they realized they'd lost. Yeah? Um, what ends up happening is, is then um, to pay, he's a man of his word. <laughs> so he goes down to the next city, down, kills 30 of theirs, 
which is of the Philistines. Yeah? And if you remember, the accusation is, is that he just came there to steal from the Philistines in the first place. So he actually, because of how it works there, he actually takes back from them to give to the same selfish ones that were already living out all of that. Yeah? Then when he gets back, her dad has already, so he's just married her. And the dad gives her to the best man, which was the best friend of Samson. The dad does that. Okay? Now, best friend was a Philistine, wasn't it? Um, then probably. It does not say one way or the other, but there, I mean, there's a good chance. We just say it that way because where they're at, the location of where they're at, and it makes it sound like it's like right there. Yeah. That it wasn't something that was far away, and this was a town of Philistines. Okay? So while they control um, the Hebrews and um, took from them and all of that kind of thing, um, they actually usually did live in like a different, a different town. Is so that, uh, honestly, it does not say, okay? Um, guys, be careful reading ahead. I see some of you guys trying to read ahead, and then you're not focused on the story of where we're at right now. Maybe. Is she asleep? That's why I just said, don't read ahead. Okay. You're trying to read ahead, and then you're missing out on what we're talking about right now, okay? So, because we will, we will get into that, okay? Um, so bringing this up to that point right there, though, and holding right now at that point. Let's back up. The lion, the lion and the hunt. Okay. Um, what's stronger than a lion? As far as the animal world, keep it, keep it very physical. What's what, what's stronger than a lion? A wilderness. And, you know, the lion is the king of the jungle, right? I mean, like the king for the reason. Yeah. There's no greater predator, right? And so, I mean, you think about it. A young buck lion gonna be strong, gonna be fast. Yes. What's your odds? You have no weapons. Yeah. So if you don't have the strength to fight against this lion, yes. And the lion came roaring. Um, I personally have heard lions roar. Luckily, I knew that they were in cages because, like, literally, even with them in a cage. The vibration that you feel within your own body is very, I mean, like, you you get it. Like, he, he's a boss. <laughs> you know? And, and, and like, you get that very, very quickly, right? Um, what's sweeter than honey? No, wine is not. Uh, if, if you're drinking wine at that, that's that sweet, there's something wrong with your wine. <laughs> You've had too much honey. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, there are sweet wines. I'm sorry. But, okay. um, you know, honestly, guys, uh, as far as just natural sugars and everything else being in there, and you understand that this is not a point in time in which you're going to go down and buy sugars just to put into everything. And you're not going to go be pre buy things in a store that's already got sugars added to it to make it sweet. Right? So, in our day and time, you know, that might be a little bit of a different concept to us. But, I mean, naturally, what's sweeter than honey? And did you also know of how much nutrients is actually in honey? It's actually very, very good for you um, in the sense that, like, obviously, anything too much is not good. Yeah? But um, at the same time, you know, um, talk about like a, a, a power pack of energy and nutrients, and at the same time, sweet as can be. Yeah? And so you kind of get like the preciousness of being able to find that honey. Yes? Um, if you were out in the wilderness, that's that's a life source. Right there. Does that make sense? Um, Jay, you were waving your hand right No, no, no. It just, it, it's uh, like the area, wherever you, if you, if you get local honey in the area, you may have trees, different trees that you might be allergic to. That honey would help you to fight off the allergies of, of that. So, I mean, it's, there's a lot of good within the, 
tons, tons of different things. Helps you to be able to overcome and survive the natural things around you that are kind of attacking you. It also, right? It also doesn't spoil. It doesn't spoil. You can carry it with you. I mean, like again, guys. I mean, like the list of how awesome it is is pretty big. Yes. And then there's the, the going back to that lion and the strength and the terror, for, honestly, of a roar from a lion. Um, you know what the scripture talks about with a lion and a roaring lion? Satan goes about as a roaring lion. Yes? Seeking to devour. Yeah? And then all of a sudden it says, this lion jumps out to eat him, to maul him, to kill him. And it says, and then the spirit of the Lord moved upon him mightily. And with his bare hands, he rips the lion right apart. What does it tell you? What's the symbolic message do you think that's in there? Okay. God's defeat of Satan. Yes? No matter how strong a lion is, God's still stronger. Which somebody had stated earlier, I was trying not to address that at that, at that moment. Yes? You know what else is very, very significant and symbolic in this? Is if you have the Holy Spirit, if you have the Holy Spirit, Satan, with all the strength and with all the roar and with everything else, guess what? He ain't got a chance. He's already destroyed, ripped apart. Into nothingness. Just a carcass of emptiness. Yes? And actually, God used something so horribly destructive to bring about the most sweetest of things for all of us to make. So through the destruction of that lion, which is through Jesus Christ, comes the sweetest honey. Now just think about everything that was just spoken about, about honey and the strength, the being able to overcome the natural things around us, um, even though it attacks us and this and that, and how that honey can help. Yes, but you know, that honey's Christ. Preserves. It's the word of God. It never goes back. It provides energy and strength. Helps fight against the natural things around that attack us, even in our bodies. Christ. And he used something that looks like it's so strong and destructive to show how strong he is and how he doesn't want us to be destroyed but instead have life. And then that life wasn't just kept but brought to others. It's brought to his family. Now no doubt if you would have told mom, hey I got this out of the line of body, she probably would not have eaten the <laughs> Should I whoop him and bring it here into the house? <laughs> Sorry for the joke. All right. Anyways, the point of the spiritual side, guys, and symbolic, what I see um, symbolically in that um, is just really the power of the Lord, the strength of the Lord, His mind, Him overcoming, Him using us to overcome all we're still yet here in this world. And that in that, guys, man, we can live from the land of milk and honey still yet today on the promises of God. Okay. Somebody uh, get with Carol and explain to her the last 15 minutes of class. <laughs> 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 um, um, I don't know which phrase. Um, the life, the, the strength, the power, the life that it gives, um, the salvation, like to me symbolically, like what it represents is Christ. And it's the, the, the one is the sweetness, the, is the, um, the energy, um, the ability um, to deal with and fight against the things that come at us in this world. Um, I don't know if that's any of the ones that you're looking for. Huh? Perfect food. Doesn't go bad, just like the words of God. Okay. Um, so as the story continues, we move on in. Um, he brings up this uh, riddle. He's there with these individuals. God, again, is working all these things for God's purpose. Okay, keep that in mind. Yes? And so with that, the egg of the gates of grass, he goes down, he kills the 30 men. All of this is all building for Samson to be what God wanted Samson to be. Now, another point. 
what were the rules for Nazareth? Don't touch nothing dead. Don't drink, wine. Don't drink anything from a vine. And do not cut your hair. So, so far, how are we doing? He touched something dead. And he's been oh, drinking he for seven days. He only touched the honey. No, no, he killed he, he killed him. He, he ripped him apart, and which is a dead carcass at that point. I mean, he's dead. He touched him. So he's done. Yeah. And in order to stick his hand down inside there, he, like, he, he touched him. So I mean he's he like so my point is guys is like as far as like the, the law, he's already broken it. And yet what did God say that he was to him? He said he's a Nazarite. God said, unto me he will be. Unto me he will be a Nazarite. And so how could God see it that way? Which comes into, I think, what Clint just said. What did you just say, Clint? Blameless. Because God had to see him blameless. How could God see him blameless? Right. Through Jesus Christ. Through the honey. <laughs> yeah? Which is a really, really neat thing, guys. Now, God uses this whole incident here with this young lady. Uh, one thing real quick that was uh, that's also brought up here, the manipulation thing back and forth, okay? Um, one thing and for, you know, um, leaders and things like that, um, oftentimes um, this comes in one of two forms. And um, the wife um, being upset about something and trying to manipulate the husband into a certain situation so in that way she can get what she wants, or other people outside trying to manipulate her to manipulate the husband so that way they can get what they want. Because if, as long as they were trying to manipulate him just directly, that wasn't working. But the pressure that a wife can put on a husband can be oftentimes painful. Exactly. Christine said it, not me. <laughs> she said that's how the fall of man started. <laughs> the manipulation of the wife. And it like, but, you know. <laughs> no. And, you know, all the really jokes in that, always remember that Adam is so okay? But, but the jokes there, that is good, though, Christine. Yeah, we, we could do, like, a whole Christian comedy off of this whole life. <laughs> um, um, okay. Um, of course, some people might call us blasphemers and stuff like that, too, though, man, but um, that's pretty funny. Um, um, one thing that you guys know, um, you know, on both sides, you know, um, so right here you see that side of her being manipulated, and then yet on the other hand, um, right before this, we've seen Samson's mom not being manipulated by any of the situations or anything that's going on standing in faith. Yes? So, point, uh, women of faith, stay in faith. Stay in faith. Yes? You don't let those outside manipulate you into something. Okay? Um, for those for those of you that are that are uh, men and have um, women, um, you know, uh, uh, understand that they, they don't don't blame her necessarily for it. It's, it's something that it, it happens. And actually, if you even look at it with Samson, um, he does not hold her. He's not at, at, He's not even angry and upset with her. Even though he was very annoyed, but he makes that very very clear. Yes, by the seventh day, that's why he finally gives in. Yes, but at the same time, guys, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, that living in the game, playing of the, uh, they did this, they did that, um, accusation, guilt. Um, Condemnation, judgments against each other, and then what ends up happening? Is you end up having a marriage and it's split. Because all this game plan and what's not being lived at the whole entire time is God or Jesus. What's not being seen is God or Jesus. Do you understand? And so, you know, um, just be wise to that, you know, um, and, and understand that it, it, that it really it does exist. There's a great warning to be had in here for both, for both parties. Okay? The other thing is, is that in the end of all of it, God still used it for good. Yes? We're going to jump into 15 real quick because this part of the story really had not ended. The whole thing with the wife. Okay? 
So if you remember, so Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been who had been his best man. It says, after a while, in the time of wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. And he said, let me go into my wife, into her room. But her father would not permit him to go in. So, okay. Samson gets angry, goes back to his father's house. His wife by her father is given to the best man. So after a period of time, Samson comes down, comes back to go get his wife. Does that make sense? So when he gets there, the dad refuses to let him in, and he says, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion, to your best friend. Is not her younger sister even better than she? Please, take her instead. I don't know if I was that younger sister if I'd have been too happy about that kind of conversation. Especially after what had just happened. Samson said to them, So this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Then Samson went and he caught 300 foxes. And he took torches. And he turned the foxes tail to tail and put a torch between each of the pair of the tails. And when he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines. And he burned up both the shocks and the standing grain, as well as the vineyards and even the olive groves. I've seen that in a movie before. And I didn't even realize that it was right there in the Bible. The foxes light the fox, they light a torch from the end of the fox's tail, tie it on, and let the fox run through the field. Samson was the first one that finished from all the shadow, yeah. <laughs> then the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they answered, They said, Samson, the son in law of Timon, because he, was take, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up, and they burned her and her father with fire. I don't know what was up with the Philistines and burning. If you remember just a little bit ago, they were threatening to do the same thing to her over the 30 articles of blood. Over what? Over the 30 articles of clothing? No. Over the riddle, the whole thing there with the riddle? They threatened her then with the same thing. And they burned her with fire, and they burned her father also. So Samson said to them, Since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on all of you. And after that, then I will cease. So he attacked them, hip and thigh, with a great slaughter. Hip and thigh, there's no real definition. Try to look it up, try to look, you know, people all have their opinion. With a great slaughter, usually what that meant was that there was much destruction, including limbs being cut off and things like that. So if you put it together, hip and thigh, Attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Um, he was not known to carry weapons. Samson never did. He picked up things and used them, but him carrying the weapon did not. Hip and thigh, uh, the only thing that kind of would be like wrestling. And then usually what they would try to do is you check them with your hip, grab your thigh, and then try to flip them, you know, and things like that. Um, so he basically, like the kind of what I think that means is, is that it was all by hand combat, and so they like, killed them, slaughtering them. We did it all by hand. Okay. Um, so he attacked, he attacked them, hit the thigh with a, and with a great slaughter. Then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock at Adam. The of the rock is a good place. Right? Yeah. Um, by the way, I tried to look at this part too, and it is, they, 
nobody really knows what, where, or anything like that, like as far as this cleft in the rock. Probably just some kind of sliver that he found that he could get up into, but it would then protect it from the weather and everything like that. So a nice, a nice place to stay. Um, it says, now the Philistines went up and encamped in Judah, and they deployed themselves against Leah. And the men of Judah said, why have you come up against us? So they answered, we have come up to arrest Samson, to do to him as he has done to us. So then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the clouds of the rock to go meet Samson. At least the men of Judah were smart. <laughs> we're going to take 3,000 of us to go over there and have a conversation. <laughs> and then they said, Do you not know that the Philistines rode over us? What is this that you have done unto us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done unto them. But they said to him, We have come down to arrest you that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. Then Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves. So they spoke to him, saying, No, but we will tie you securely and deliver you into their hand. But we will surely not kill you. And they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. Do you know what they made the ropes out of at that time? If they were new ropes meant for strength, they would be made from leather with hair and plant fibers, most commonly flax fibers and hair around the leather, solid leather. Uh, that, uh, I mean, just, you know, just even the hair and the flax probably by itself would have been really strong. You add in that leather. I mean, basically what you got is like a steel cable. I mean, that's like the essence of what you just built right there. You know, it's going to be very, very strong growth. Um, so when he came to Leah, the Philistines came shouting against him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and the ropes that were on him became like flax that had been burned in the fire, and his bones broke loose from his hand. Have you ever taken a rope and then put fire on it and then pulled it? It's like, it's like butter. He found a fresh job on a monkey, reached out his hand, and he took it, and he killed a thousand men with it that day. Then Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. The question still begs the wonder. At 990, like what point were you that last four or five dudes going, man, oh yeah, I'm still going, I'm going to get him now, he's tired. <laughs> like at some point, like, hey, you go first, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to go in over here. Like, I, mean, I don't know. Uh, yeah, that's just, that's just pretty amazing. So when he finished, he, um, he's finished speaking, he threw the job on the, uh, uh, job on the donkey. The, the King James Version is a different word there besides donkey. So I almost, which God did. And so they call that place Ramath Le, which meant the jawbone height. Because with the jawbone, he made a big high pile of bodies. Heaps upon heaps. Okay, we're going to stop there, guys. Time for time, all right? Huh? <laughs> okay, all right. Well, because like, the story doesn't really like, just, okay, fine. And so it was when he had finished speaking that he threw the jaw, bone of the army, and he named it the jaw of night. Then he came very thirsty, so he cried out to the Lord, and he said, You have given us great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die in thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. So God split the hollow place that is in Leah, and the water came out, and he drank, and his spirit returned to him, and he was revived. Therefore he called its name in Hakor, which is in Leah to this very day. 
and he judged Israel 20 years in the days of the Philistines. And it was the name of that place is called the Spring of the Call. So he called out to the Lord, and the Lord gave him a spring to him. Is that still there today? That's, that's what it said. And so at the time, yeah. at the time the book of Judges was written, and that spring was still there. So I don't know how much time period necessarily was in between the actual happening and the writing, but it's still there up, up to that point. Okay. Um, so I have no idea as far as still yet today. Today, I'm just gonna to to yeah. Um, but uh, there, at the day of the time when the books of Judges was written, it was. Um, guys, honestly, there's a lot of little good little tidbits that are down through here. Okay, um, that in that in that chapter. Um, You know, God said he was going to do what with Samson? Going to use him to, to free the people from the Philistines. To, to do, I'm oh, sorry, Clint, what did you say? He's going to use him to, to free the people from the Philistines. Okay. Is God doing that? <laughs> He's killing them all, <laughs> driving them back. Um, you know, guys, even to the point that they're killing each other. <laughs> Yeah, which we've seen before with Gideon, right? That God uses their own fear and anger and things like that against each other for them to destroy each other. Yeah? And um, guys, you know, spiritually, like, those kind of, these kind of things are very, very true. The other thing that I always want to point out is, is you know, I mean, out of, out of the judges that has been listed up to this point, how do you think Samson is? Character-wise, or maybe morality-wise, how does Samson fair enough? Huh? He's fine. <laughs> okay, and honestly, compared to a lot of the other judges, though, you'd have to look at him. I mean, a lot of the stuff that he's doing and things like that is very, it's, it, this is not your normal script. No, not at all. You know, the other ones, the other kings have raised up, and then God says, no, you take care of this army and you go. Right? This time, I mean, it ain't, hey, you go get some army. No, I am the army. God, I am your strength. No man can hurt you. Yeah, those are the promises that God has given him, right? You will free the people. Yeah? You're going to destroy the Philistines. Yeah, you know, the means by which the, the way that God is working with different things for that to take place is not necessarily the way that, again, we would think, and we would think morality-wise, should be the way. But God works in mysterious ways. And God's ways are not our ways. And God's ways are so much better than our ways that as the heavens are high above the earth, so are God's ways way higher than our ways. Yes? Guys, you know, so again, kind of the point of this is that God's promises are still God's promises and they're still the true. The means by which getting there, you know, God promised the people that he was going to lead them in the land of milk and honey, did he? Yes, he did. He led his people into the land of milk and honey. Oh, you know, almost an entire generation died. But did God still lead in his people? Yes. Because, you know, it isn't always the way that we want it to be or the way that we want it to look. We're not always the way that we want to look and that we want to be. Yeah? But from these heroes of faith, what has God been showing us over and over and over and over again? You know, no matter what you think of yourself, what you think of somebody else, no matter how things look, how bad or how good, God is still God. He's God over all of it. It is done. It, you know, and when Christ cried out, man, it's been, and it, guys, it's been that way. And God says, man, I'll go before you and give you the victory. Guess what's already laid out? The victory. Now, the arriving at it, and I'll tell you what, as Samson, when your wife is taken from you, used to manipulate you, then take it away and give them to your best friend. I mean, you know, the emotion of all of that that would be going on, right? And, but however, God took even that evil, that pain and the suffering of all of that, and used it for God's good. Does that make sense? God works all things. He knows all things. Believe him, though, and follow him. Those who do not believe him, then they what they need is destruction. And even the old father could not believe that Samson really loved 
couldn't believe that God would really love for Samson and his daughter to be able to make that. You know, he thought because Samson left all mad, then that had something to do with necessarily with her, and he wasn't even angry with her. You know how sometimes we live things? Somebody gives us a look, says something, whatever else, and we, in our mind, create this whole entire reality that's not even reality. And then what it leads us to is more destruction. And making decisions, thoughts, things, and what we're not thinking about is who? God, His love, His strength, His power. Yeah? You know, if he believed that, you know what, God was really for his daughter and Samson in that marriage, if he would have just believed that, then you know where he would probably have been at with his daughter? He would have been down there at Samson's dad's house. Say, hey, listen, where's your boy? Here's his wife. Take her. Take care of her. Be a husband. Because that's what God says to do, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, he would have just believed God, but instead, him and her did not. And then I honestly feel bad kind of for this best friend because I don't know what it doesn't say whatever took place between Samson and him as far as their friendship. But what we do know is that he ended up losing his wife also, which was Samson's wife first, but he ends up losing his wife. She gets burned to death. And that had to happen right there in front of him, by the way. It says that she was drug out, him and her, and burned. So he was, you know, you understand what I'm saying? Like the pain and the evil that just kind of compiles and compiles and compiles just because we would not believe God. Not just this, God's love. Yeah? So the warning side in it is, man, guys, no. You know, live God's love. And if you're not, then understand that that destruction, that's when that destruction comes. Now, as far as just pain and suffering, the cursedness of the squirrel, things not going on, man, it doesn't, oftentimes it doesn't look like it is, but guess what God's love? For our good. So trust him in that. Yeah? Don't let the anger and the bitterness rule. Don't let the paranoia and the fears rule. Like, look at all the trouble that it caused already in the story. Yeah? But instead, let God rule your heart. Yeah? Let peace rule in your heart. Let the words of God dwell in your heart richly. And it'll give you the ability for all perseverance. It'll give you the strength of the Lord. And no matter even if Satan himself comes to you roaring with God's words, you can rip that right in half and instead have the sweetest humming. Yeah, and be able then to take it to somebody else and give it to them that they could also partake in the hunt. And they don't even have to be bothered by the lion. That was another thing. He didn't, he didn't spread the roar of the lion. He spread the hunt. Yeah? A lot of neat points, guys, throughout the story that I just really, really love. So, anyways, guys, I love you. We're at 15 after all bowls. Um, after we have a word of prayer, we will get 15 after. All right? Derek, how you doing? Good. Everybody fall asleep on the back there. No? Okay, all right. I was going to, be, I was going to have somebody back there slap you around and lay it on the river quick, but. <laughs> I heard a little. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>